Okay, hello everyone, and welcome to uh, another interview at Room for Discussion. I'm James, and this is Lois, and we're the interviewers today. So, coming up to halfway through 2020, the year has definitely been one for the history books, that I think it's fair to say for all the wrong reasons. For many, it must seem that all the, the strife, anger, division, and kind of general worldly chaos of the past few years has kind of come to a head and really, really culminated into the first six months of this year. And so amidst all of this suffering and uncertainty, we thought it'd be a good time to talk about our attitude towards the things on the other end of the spectrum, towards happiness and human well-being. This is a topic that has been seeping into our politics since around the turn of the century, but it definitely feels like there has been an explosion of interest in uh, happiness and, and positive psychology over the last few years, with uh, some of the, the prescribed methods gaining real traction in our, in our Western culture. We're going to talk about these developments with Ashley Frawley. She's a sociology lecturer at Swansea University. Her teachings and research looks at the sociology of health, well-being, how we view social problems. And she has been critical of uh, some aspects of the, the positive psychology movement and this general turn towards happiness as uh, both a problem and a solution in 21st century society. She's published articles on this and has written a book, The Semiotics of Happiness, Rhetorical Beginnings of a Public Problem which looks at the rise of happiness as a social and political symbol. For this interview, we've taken her three, three critiques she has of uh, the positive psychology movement and the, the wider happiness movement, um, and they're kind of our basic structure and starting point into this conversation. Before we go into that, we actually don't want to, to talk about your Twitter. Um, so we were looking at this Twitter. It's a great Twitter account, by the way. It's, it's, it's nice. Um, yeah, when we were researching the interview, and we saw in your, your bio, you describe yourself as a grumpy happiness critique. <laughs> yeah, and so this kind of yeah got us thinking like do you ever really get any backlash to your work in the sense of people seeing you as kind of I don't know talking down about happiness or you know maybe they ask you you know why are you critiquing this it's not really something we need to worry about do you ever kind of get any pushback on this level uh, what's very interesting is that early on I did so I started um the project that would that was ultimately that book published in 2015 in 2008 and um, so I would, when I was doing the research, as you do, I would go to conferences and I would present. And at that point, it was like the big idea, the new thing. This is going to be like, a, a, you know, world changing and so on, revolutionary, radical. I talk about it in the book, this rhetoric of radicalism that tends to be, um, these sorts of discourses will tend to be described in these ways. And at that time, it was very fresh. And so people would say like, but it's just, you know, what do you, you know, what do you want? You want people to be depressed, <laughs> you know? And that's how, that's kind of how these things become really powerful is because they sound so good, right? So you gain far more by joining the, the movement. I, I've got a purple hand, I keep noticing. <laughs> I obviously have had to dye my own hair <laughs> during really lockdown. Good. Yeah, <laughs> I keep noticing when I do this. Anyways, um, yeah, like, um, it's, it sounds so positive. So, you know, it, like, you gain far more by joining with it than you do by organizing against it. And it also sets up a particular frame, right? So if we're talking about happiness, it seems like we should be talking about happiness. And if you want to criticize it, then you should champion its opposite. You should just negate it, right? And, and some people would be like, against happiness, right? Um, but that's not really what I was interested in. And so I'd have to explain to people, it's not that I'm like arguing that people should be depressed. I'm wondering what kind of culture feels comfortable talking about its problems through the language of emotion. Um, and, and sees the promotion of positive emotions, and not just positive emotions, it's part of like a broader kind of um, discourse of like disorganized subjectivity or um, like um, disorganized psychology um, that's been around for, for a long, long time as, a, as, a, as an understanding of why things go wrong. You know, like if you think about economic crisis, what's the, you know, the, if you talk to somebody on the street, what's the cause of the economic crisis? They'll say greed. Right, so it's always something about human emotion that ultimately lies at the root of social problems. Well, what kind of culture thinks that? What, what kind of mm -hmm. culture finds that compelling? Um, mm -hmm. So I did initially get a lot of flack. I remember um, um, giving a paper at a conference and someone put up their hand and was like, you know, it's, it's all very convincing. You put up this wonderful theoretical machinery, but we just, we need this now. <laughs> we just we need this now. now is the time yeah. it has this wonderful yeah. profoundness right. to it profundity mm. and this sense of like big ideas right mm. this, our mm. society's been directionless for such a long time and so we're kind of open to these woolly ultimately very woolly but nice sounding ideas mm. that are mm. radical and so on but ultimately 
don't really mean or do anything. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're kind of at that point at the end of history, right? You can't really talk to people as communists or as neoliberals or, you know, even as Christians or as Muslims as a whole, you can't really talk to these, uh, well, people do talk to these identities, but if you want to talk to everybody, you're not really going, you can't really talk, speak to a particular like political identity. And so what do you do? You talk to people with the lowest common denominator, and that's the, the language of health and mental health and psychology. And that's kind of where we are. So when he said to me, well, we need this now, I said, you're right, but not in the way that you think you're right, mm -hmm. um, that our culture does lack purpose. And so we're sort of like scrounging around in, in the like um, garbage bins for all sorts of ideas. And, and I think for, for particular reasons, emotions have become very, very powerful. It's not just mm -hmm. one thing picked out of mm -hmm. the air. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really what my critique is about. But yeah, I did used to get flack, but it's interesting that I don't get that anymore because the movement is a bit passe. It, mm -hmm. it, and, and that's what my book that I'm writing right now is about, the way that these things, these fads, these therapeutic fads, um, kind of imperceptibly tumble over into a new fad. So it's like everyone thinks they can be radical by criticizing happiness. And, and everyone agrees with me now um, mm -hmm. because they're on to the next thing. Mm, but yeah. you're right, we shouldn't really be talking about well-being we, or mm. happiness. We should be talking about well-being. Mm, we shouldn't mm. really be talking about well-being. We should be talking about mental health, the promotion mm. of mental health or mindfulness or something like that. And I can tell where we are in that fad cycle by how much flack I get. So I get, so mindfulness is another fad that I've been looking at. And a lot of people will agree with me, which tells me we're kind of like on the way, <laughs> but I still get quite a lot of flack. Um, but you know, you could criticize self-esteem, the self-esteem movement, and no one really stands up for it. And that was a very big deal in the 90s, uh, late 80s, or um, up till about the late 1990s. Um, but nobody will stand up and be like, what we really need is to build self-esteem, and that's gonna solve knife crime. Nobody really says that, but they might talk about like, oh, well, these people, they come from really bad families and, and uh, you know, it's so hard <laughs> to raise children in these circumstances and they've got so many mental health problems. And it's this very individualized kind of discourse um, that will use this, whatever the new fad is. But in the same way that they did in the 90s, they would have talked about mm -hmm. self-esteem, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and how much flack you get is really an indicator of where we are in that cycle. Yeah. So kind of tying into that, I think we could kind of be fair to conclude that you're researching the narrative surrounding happiness. Um, and we were kind of wondering, what is it like to, because you're not actually researching how to be happy, you're researching how we talk about happiness. What it's, there's this distance between you and the subject of happiness. How, what is it like to research in this way? Yeah, it confuses people a lot. So people will, um, it's, I, I often think, man, I wish I wasn't so crotchety and difficult because if I could just, if I was a bandwagon jumper, my life would be mm. a lot easier um, because people yeah. will come to me and offer me money um, to do all sorts of weird things. And I just wonder like, wow, these happiness experts, like they've really hit on something. And that's another thing that there's a, that is a, a big part of this is that it's an enormous industry very very lucrative um as soon as the like they it's it's a pattern in each and every one of these fads you know the founder has this like magical moment of awakening where they discover the true meaning of happiness or mindfulness or whatever it is it's always the same it's, it's amazing actually it has this like magical side to it but also they're obsessed with presenting it as science so it's the science as hard as nails you know that goes into this um so it's this weird mixture of um, of magic and um, enchantment and re-enchanting everyday life at the same time as they claim they, they make these very strong claims to um, to science. Um, yeah, that, that's strange actually because it, it sounds like you know it's got this quasi-religious feel to it but you know juxtaposed with science to kind of lend it some legitimacy. Well yeah because um, scientism is kind of like the new religion of mm. our culture um, so that is the misapplication of science to the human world. Um, so mm. you kind of treat human, so it's, you, you treat human, you tell these like just so stories in the same way that myths used to tell, well, why are we here? Because God, you know, on the seventh day, <laughs> all that stuff. Right. It's like you know, these, these stories that are completely impossible to verify about evolution and so on. Well, because evolutionarily we did this, you know, mm. and it's just these just so stories that have an air of science to them. So it speaks to this disenchanted time, but at the same time, it offers this kind of 
imputation of enchantment of everyday life. I think mindfulness is a really big one for that. It offers to like enchant, like eating a grape, you know, like there's, um, there's the, like I did this like discourse analysis and one of the things that they always say is, um, uh, you should eat a grape mindfully or eat a raisin mindfully, eat a piece of, so it's like this, this every moment of every day becomes kind of enchanted. Um, and so it speaks to that kind of loss of, of meaning that people really do feel in their lives. Um, but the anchor for meaning used to be in other things, things beyond the self, right? So if you were religious, you lived your life for some purpose. Um, uh, I think it's Chantal Dalsal has a good book where um, she talks about most people live their lives as though they were signs, um, as though they were um, signifiers of something else beyond themselves. And now the, um, the signifier and signified is in one body. So it's like socialism in one person, <laughs> yeah. salvation in one person. The, that anchor for truth and meaning is inside you now. Um, and so that's how, that's, that's where this sort of enchantment comes from. It's um, just lost the yeah. feel evangelical about like low carb in the way that they would have yeah, felt yeah. evangelical about, about God, you know, um, several hundred years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think we're going to, you know, unpack a lot of what you've just talked about, uh, mm. yeah, throughout the, throughout the course of, uh, of this interview. Um, but we're gonna, yeah, for the first first critique that we kind of want to get to. Um, but yeah, so the first critique, we're kind of just also wondering, um, you talk a lot about positive psychology. What does it refer to? Like, what, what do you mean by positive psychology? I think it's to get everyone on the same level. Right. Well, my work isn't necessarily a critique of positive psychology per se, although that's certainly part of it. Um, because these claims, you know, my, obviously the first, my first book and my first publications were all on happiness. Um, but since then, I've noticed that there's, it's not just this one thing in isolation. It's a, it's a reiteration. It's not exactly the same, but it's very similar um, of earlier discourses from like mental hygiene, um, self-esteem happiness and there's actually overlap um between a lot of these things and i'm i'm trying to understand how one thing moves to another like that and why kind of why this is happening because what happens is you you critique one discourse right you cr criticize the happiness movement and then everybody's with you and then you're kind of like knocking at an open door and you have to ask yourself well, why this thing that people were like you know really attacking me about five years ago suddenly everyone's on my side that's weird also i'm not mm. used to people agreeing with me so <laughs> um, so then i sort of move on to something else so it's not just positive psychology mm. but positive psychology is definitely the source of a massive of a huge amount of of information and quasi scientific this sort of um um this like project to um spread this basically the tentacles of this like positive kind of movement all across the world so in my book where positive psychology comes in is really so in uh the late 1990s um martin seligman um who's a, an american psychologist um you know hit upon positive psychology and said you know this is going to be the next big thing and actually it was it was in the in early and mid 1990s that the whole network was formed and they actually had like a very specific and strategic plan of getting positive psychology all across the world so they had like a positive law positive government positive education you know but it was a very concerted project and you have to be very careful when something appears in the news newspapers right it suddenly grabs the headlines you think like, so happiness made the headlines in 2003 and that it became, that was really what kicked off this whole, whole big thing was when um, claims makers in the UK took hold of this positive psychology and pressed it in service of social problem claims. And, you know, they made a conscious campaign around it. Well, when you see it hit the headlines, you think, well, why are we all talking about happiness? It must be because suddenly we all became very unhappy. And that's what people would initially talk to me, ask me about. They'd say, well, obviously, if we're talking about it, it's because we're very unhappy. But actually, no, even according to positive psychologists, we're just as unhappy or happy as we've ever been. Most people rate themselves all sorts of different ways of measuring happiness. But most people rate themselves, give people a 10 point scale. They'll usually say about a seven. And it differs depending on the country. And there's a lot of different debates about um, if there's like feeling rules involved, you know, like it's like a cultural thing where you say, how are you? I'm fine. Thanks. You know, <laughs> there's like a cultural thing going on that it may differ in different countries. But anyways, it hasn't really changed that much. 
And what's interesting about that is that that lack, lack of change became uh, formulated into a problem. And so it was this wonderful rhetorical strategy where as soon as you, so you've got this thing, no, no change in happiness. On the face of it, that's not all that interesting, but combine it with something else and you've got a perfect rhetorical strategy. So the big thing, the big claim was in spite of enormous economic growth over the past half century, we are no happier. And that got repeated again and again and again. And that was really the impetus for it. Um, of course, that makes no sense at all, because um, while money can increase forever, an individual will only get so happy. Um, and that's not why money increases. You know, the economy is much more complex mm. than misguided pursuits for happiness. And also, it's not like, you know, if I was born in 1950 and I reached an eight in my life, my child is going to go from an eight and build up, right? Each person is born into the world and it's as new and normal to them you know, as it is to each generation. You don't like build up on the happiness of each mm. generation. But also, why money? Isn't that interesting? In spite of like female empowerment, like the fact that women are in, in work, you know, and, and have rights and can vote and all that stuff, still no happier. Come on, ladies, back in the kitchen. Like nobody says that. Why those particular things? Or like <laughs> massive, um, you know, um, uh, leaps and bounds in terms of like multiculturalism and all sorts, like the NHS, yeah. like anything at all that's happened since the 19, late 1940s when they started t doing happiness surveys, nothing has made anybody any happier. So the more likely explanation is that you ask somebody, how are you? They're like, that ah, could be worse. <laughs> like, and, but it became this big thing. And so I, you know, I try to explain why it was money in particular. Um, that, and is, that, uh, is that got to do with, just, you know, economics as a discipline has, you know, utility, which I guess is a conception of happiness. Like, it is, you know, money and wealth is, you know, at least in theory, meant to be tied to, to human well-being and to, to happiness in some way. Is that kind of where this money... Yeah, so that's where the whole rhetoric of radicalism comes from. So they started, they started saying like, well, you know, if, if money doesn't really make people happy, this questions the fundamental underpinnings of, uh, of the economy and of economics and so on. But it didn't really, um, because uh, if you think about it, I don't typically go on strike asking my employer to pay me less. Right. So there's this idea that, you know, it's, it's this idea of so radical, right? Money doesn't make you happy. Uh, well, what have working class movements been fighting for, if not more, more of the social product that they create? And so it had this underlying kind of um, presentism and romanticism about it um, that was very anti-worker, very anti-consumption um, and very bourgeois. Um, Which is okay if, yeah, if you're middle class and well off, then you Oh, can... exactly. Oh, you don't want what I have. Yeah, Ooh, it's yeah, so terrible. Yeah, it's yeah. awful. Ordering flowers every week. It's, you know, um, you know, you don't want to get caught up in the rat race. Your life is so sweet and simple. You know, and they'll actually, they would actually say this. And there's all these, like, when I was analyzing this discourse, there was this tendency to really romanticize poverty um, as though, you know, um, people living in Africa, their poverty is natural and they're like animals. Like the way that they would talk about um, people in, in poorer countries and developing countries was really like they're part of nature and preserving their way of life is like preserving nature. And so there was this like, um, like noble savage kind of romanticism about it as well. Um, so yeah, it was very like this, this very um, sort of bourgeois kind of, um, I'm not even bourgeois, it's like, um, an older kind of romantic, backward looking um, kind of uh, rejection of the present that in the absence of a more like communist in the sense of like a Marxist, um, you know, working class movement for bettering our material circumstances in the absence of that kind of movement can sound very radical, but it's actually very antithetical to what working class movements in the past have fought for. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so you kind of already unpacked uh, your critique on how happiness is viewed as an acultural universal good. Um, mm -hmm. But we were kind of wondering, there is the chemical stuff, the chemicals that get released in your brain when you're happy. And this is kind of, you could say, universal. How would you uh, tie that into your own critique? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's like, well, well, there are some differences in terms of culture that I, that's not really my area of research, but are, are interesting. So, um, you know, the way that we 
um, categorize feelings and so on is different in different cultures um, and where they're even located in the body can be different as well. Um, but in terms of like, yeah, the feeling of happiness, yes, that's universal. But what actually causes that feeling of happiness is going to is going to change what is necessary for it. And this is why I say at the beginning of that book that it becomes a critique of change because it'll, they'll be like, oh, you know, all you really need is your family and, you know, and what you really need is religion. And our surveys say that this is what people like and want. Um, so the majority of people like and want this thing. It makes them happy. Ergo, it must be good. And so that is basically taking a snapshot of the way things are today and saying, why are you so upset? <laughs> like, look, you know, all you need is this bare minimum. They're all, they'll all talk about like basic needs as well, basic needs. But what, what is a basic need will change depending on the material base of society, right? So is internet a basic need? Some people will say yes, some people will say no. You could list all the things that you think are basic um, and then people will take it down to like base animal. Like really all you need is just enough food to survive. Like, is that living? Is that and, like, and if that's all you need, right? Then why do people uproot their lives, get on little rickety boats and try to get across the Mediterranean to a better life because they want something materially better. And that is really seen, looked down upon as, oh, what a shame, you know, um, that's like false consciousness or um, they, they want what we have and they don't realize that it's actually quite bad. As though they would love to just build a wall <laughs> so that we could just keep living the way we do and just keep those people out because they don't realize that, oh, look at them. It's like looking at them in a zoo, you know? <laughs> and it's this, and, and the, they would really say, like, I remember reading one where it's like, um, the, reading an article they're talking about these people have in in poorer countries that have radios and uh you know oh they've got radios so they can they've got our advertisements and it's so sad because now they have this desire that can't be fulfilled and that leads them to be unhappy it's not the desire it's the fact that you can't have that that's the problem right and we've yeah. completely lost that we've completely lost this i it's like this the sense that you want more is seen as a problem Mm -hmm. instead of the fact that some people have so much more because <laughs> mm -hmm. it kind of ties into your interpretation of marxism as well because i thought mm -hmm. you were saying like in your book that it's not about um it's not about like wanting something more but it's about the power difference and seeing this could you elaborate more on your your critique on how marxism is used um, yeah it's <laughs> um i kind of get in a lot of trouble for this but um you know um I was interested in, I was trying to figure out why um, these people are so anti-economic growth, because on the face of it, it sounds very anti-capitalist, um, but it's, it's not. Um, and I was going through, and so this is what kind of um, led me to read some more obscure, I don't know how obscure they are, but you know, like theories of surplus value, which is sometimes called um, capital volume four. Um, and I was trying to figure out um, why people are so, why these people who are so like, they're not radical, they're very mainstream, very well off kind of people are apparently making these like anti-capitalist um, arguments. Um, and, and I realized that actually this is a debate that's been going on for a very, very long time and going back to like Thomas Malthus and so on. Um, and it was funny because I remember there was like this quote from Marx where he talks about Thomas Malthus and I couldn't remember where it was. So I was like going through the Marxist um, internet archive looking for this darn quote and I could not find a single time that Marx mentions Malthus, Thomas Malthus, without insulting him in some way. Like, he, like, he hated Malthus. Um, you know, he called, he said, like, um, overpopulation is a slander on mankind. And he really had, uh, he called him like a plagiarist. <laughs> uh, but um, it's this idea that, look, you know, stop the world, I want to get off. We need to roll back the wheel of history. It's actually a very common kind of idea. And I think, actually, what these, these like, anti-growth growth skeptics what they're actually kind of getting at is that growth doesn't really seem to be happening or at least not easily within capitalism um, capitalism seems to have a problem um, obviously with crises periodic crises um, and it's it's almost like without realizing it they are affirming and explaining the status quo as a as like the natural steady state that capitalism is, is returning to and john Stuart mill did the same thing um so um 
he talked about it as like this harmonious stationary state um, to which capitalism is just returning because they were all like aware that capitalism is stagnating or has this potential to, to stagnate. Um, and Marx explained it through the falling rate of profit, um, this ironic um, uh, tendency within capitalism um, where it becomes very difficult to make sufficient profit from the, um, the capital that's uh, invested and reinvested. Um, and so he, he explains that this, this is a really bad <laughs> and very, very volatile um, tendency within capitalism. And the countervailing tendencies are, are partially responsible for a lot of the dynamism that we see within capitalism. Um, but you can you get this sense of like um, exhaustion amongst the ruling class. Like, let's just let it happen. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm in a great position. Um, but of course, in order to um, raise the profit rate, you know, horrible things happen. Um, so they're like naturalizing this tendency within capitalism. Uh, and Marx was like, this is not a natural tendency. This is telling us that capitalism is too big for its boots. You know, um, famously in the Communist Manifesto, Marx says that the capitalist is like the sorcerer who's unable to control the powers that he's conjured up from the netherworld. Um, uh, like the, um, the sorcerer's uh, apprentice, right? So everything <laughs> going nuts. Um, and that's kind of what capitalism is like. Um, that it's it's so powerful, so dynamic, um, that you can't make profit from it anymore. It's It has this tendency to socialize the means of production. Um, and so the goal for Marx was to, to lay hold of the means of production, obviously, and to um, release it from the uh, the fetters of capitalism. It's the pro if capitalism is slowing down, it's not because we need to hold back. It's because capitalism is holding humanity back. And and so for you, because I know that like, is it right to say that? I guess there is a certain I don't know brand of of Marxist or you know, people on the left who are you know just automatically uh, critical of, of capitalism and, and see it as a you know something that needs to be overthrown immediately and, and is just bad. But I I think is it right. Am I right in saying for you, you, you view it more, I guess, as Marx maybe perhaps originally saw it in that kind of it does a lot of good and a lot of bad and we need to get through it to get to this, you know, other side or something. It's like a stage in the process. Mm -hmm. And so and then, you know, relating it back to this this happiness thing, it's kind of by moving our attention away from, you know, certain objective conditions or something. And, and by saying, you know, well, it's all about happiness, really, it's not about these you know, economic growth or something, we're kind of stopping that process towards, you know, what you, you know, as a Marxist would hope to be the end goal. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I call it a deflection activity. Mm. Don't think about, you know, the economics, ooh, all well, that icky money, that's for the technocrats, you know, that's for the people who know what's happening. You worry about you and your own feelings and your own family. No, I'm sorry, economics used to be the stuff of politics, and it should be still the stuff of politics. And if we can learn, if we can understand the me deeper mechanisms of the economy, then perhaps we can control it. Obviously, we failed miserably doing that in the past. I, I am, I'm fully aware of that. I recognize that. Um, and I do see that as a big problem. I'm not one of these people who thinks that the USSR was like an unparalleled failure, but I do recognize that we could not overcome the law of value. Um, and so, but we, we need to figure out how, because capitalism will eat us all. <laughs> and it, you know, like I, I remember saying, um, I've been saying, you know, like all Marxists do is think a crisis is coming, crisis is coming. Um, but I, you know, there hasn't been the kind of devaluation that's quote unquote necessary to make capitalism profitable again um, for a very, very long time because it's so destructive, so terrifying. You know, like in the 1930s, you know, there was, you know, a horrible, horrible depression followed by an extraordinarily destructive war. Um, but also it, that depression and that, halfway through that war really, um, radicalized people. And we very nearly had communist revolutions like in, in places you would never expect, like in Greece, for example. Um, it, it really radicalized people. Um, and so there's that too. Not only is, is that uh, destruction um, scary and destructive, um, but also it is radicalizing. So there's been this unwillingness to allow for the kind of destruction that's necessary, which is a good thing, by the way. I don't. I'm not saying that we should allow that destruction. It's horrible. It's the destruction of people's lives. Which is why when people are like, "Ha ha, who cares?" You know, coronavirus. Let the economy collapse. Do you understand what that means? Do, like that. Who pays? You pay with your livelihood when there's a crisis. You know, like obviously, we, that's not not a necessary outcome. We have to push, 
like so we, we're not the ones who, who are who pay for a crisis um but it's not something to laugh about like it is very destructive an economic crisis is terrifying mm -hmm. and the reset afterward is terrifying like we're talking about like inter-imperialist war and that kind of thing which is what's happened in the past i think yeah. it's not something to champion it's it's very scary uh, i think mark said once that every crisis is a punishment on the working class for not overthrowing capitalism sooner <laughs> like it's, well, yeah. it's it's not something to laugh about and, you know, um, a lot of the you know costs of uh, of Corona and uh, the you know recessions around the world will pour you know fall on uh, you know the working class and, and poor people with low income households. So yeah, it's it's a very valid point to make. It's just it's interesting. You know, do you feel that kind of when you're when you're making this point, it's almost uh, for someone listening, you're you're trying to argue for the the value of economic growth maybe which do people kind of find that counterintuitive knowing that you're yeah, and this is what i was saying before about and they they and they want to critique they negate um and so like oh you don't like happiness let's or i don't like this whole happiness business let's argue for depression or against happiness or something like that um but you you have to have a um, a, like a, a, a fuller kind of understanding of what's going on. Nothing is like wholly good or wholly bad. Um, and you have to understand the processes that are at work. So I'm not like saying, oh, we should have economic growth. I'm saying we need to understand the mechanisms. And it's like, I don't know, what's the point of saying, oh, we should have economic growth. It's like saying, oh, we should have like, I don't know, it should rain tomorrow. Like, it's not something we have, like, it's not something we have a lot of control over. Uh, and when, um, you know, people in government claim that they do, they're lying through their teeth. If they did, we wouldn't have recessions. Um, so it's, it's not something like, it's, it's a silly thing to say that we should champion it because we don't have a huge amount of control over it. What we can do is try to understand the mechanisms that are going on here, why it is, why uh, capitalism is stagnating, why we have these contradictions of extraordinary wealth, extraordinary wealth, plenty for everybody. And yet, we have people who live in horrible poverty. Mm -hmm. um, how do we release that extraordinary capacity for capitalism to create um, without its destructive side? Can we do that? Is it possible? Could we create um, this world that potentially gives us all a basis of freedom where we can work if we want to work, we don't have to, we can pursue whatever it is we want to do, we can think and create and we can just think of something and create it, right? This, the, the bringing like that, the, where alienated labor is no longer a thing where, you know, subject and object come together. How do we create that world? That's what I want to talk about. I'm not talking about like championing economic growth. It's like saying, I hope it doesn't rain. Like, <laughs> um, so I, but the thing is we've never figured that out in the same way that we're like bumbling fools when it comes to the economy, we're mm. bumbling fools when it comes to, uh, post-capitalist economy too. Although there are a lot of people who are thinking about that and uh, I'm not an true. expert in, uh, in these kinds of post-capitalist kind of um, visions. Um, there are people who are thinking about um, like uh, basically how would you organize an economy if not through the market? And that's right. what I think is really important work. Um, and I am, an, I am a pure spectator um, when it comes to that. Mm. Um, uh, you know, I, I, yeah. I, would, I would really like to do a study of these kinds of post-capitalist visions because I think you can't have a blueprint for the future. Um, capitalism is already laying the basis of its own destruction, um, but it can also, we could also slip into barbarism as well. Like that destruction mm -hmm. could be just our destruction. <laughs> uh, it's not inevitably going to something higher or better. I think, yeah, I think it's a, an interesting conversation and you know, bringing it back to you know, the the positive psychology or the happiness aspect, um, yeah, your your critique, uh, the kind of individualization critique. I think you you, know, you talked a bit about it earlier. Um, this idea that uh, with happiness and in kind of the place it holds in our, our culture at the moment, you know, you kind of get these social problems being interpreted through emotional frames. And you gave the example of yeah the. The, it's the greedy banker that is the problem, not the the incentive structure that he is he is placed in. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you know uh, uh, Daniel Markovitz. He's a he's a Yale professor who's written on a kind of criticizing meritocracy. And I think he makes you know a pretty similar argument in that we kind of characterize poverty or inequality or failure as as moral failures or the, these individual mm -hmm. failures. Um, you see that? Do you see this as kind of the same line of argument that he, he that you're going down as Absolutely. well? Absolutely. Um, as the economy has become naturalized, so too have its problems. So they are r located in human psychology, in our minds, in our brains, in our nature. 
And so there's an inherently um, kind of conservative argument there, which basically says, if it's just human nature, then the way, if, if the way things are right now is simply an outgrowth of our human nature, then there's no point in trying to change anything because human nature will just reassert itself. Um, but there's a really lovely quote in, um, uh, by uh, Plekhanov, um, Soviet thinker, where he says, either human nature um, does not vary, and then it explains nothing in the course of human history or cultures which show us myriad ways of living, or it does vary, and then it's the outcome and not the cause of human society. Um, and I think that we've lost that kind of idea of human beings as an open subject, as, um, which is a very basic kind of Marxist idea, is that um, if there's anything about our human natural to us, it's that we create our own nature through the process of working on the world. Um, you know, the famous quote is the everlasting nature imposed condition that man must work on the world. Um, and in so doing, he works on himself. That we are different because we do things differently, because we construct things differently, because we, when we act on the world, we do this in particular ways. Um, and so that means that the future is open and the, and the, like an open subject means an open future. If what it means to be human is open, then the future is open. It could be anything. And I think that's really, really important. But now subjectivity is being totally closed off. It's become very determined. You are what your parents did. You are uh, a mess of, uh, and, and it's always really this slander is always said very kindly. And a very, it's like, um, that's why I really love this um, Chinese sociologist, uh, Yang Ji, who talks about um, the way that the power is starting to operate. And I'm not sure if it's starting to operate this way, but the way that power operates in China is kindly power. So power is very kind. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, the colonists also claim that they were doing things out of the kindness of their heart. But for some reason we see a break and we're like, well, no, they're truly kind now because there's nothing to like stand up against it, right? And so they, they'll say it in a very kind way, like, oh, you know, we're all a bit disorganized and we're all a bit irrational. I'm irrational too, right? So these, these um, this understanding of the human that used to be reserved for the other, for women, for ethnic minorities and so on, right? So the white man, he was rational. He was capable of being a part of public life. He was next to God. And women couldn't be part of public life. They're unsuitable for public life because they were irrational, emotional, close to animals. Now, instead of saying, oh, women, actually you can be like gods too. It's like, no, men are animals too. No, and then right. it's like, you know, and, and you say like, women are emotional. And they're like, excuse me? Like, no, no, I mean, that is a good thing. Like this, 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 what used to be this insult to women and an excuse to keep them out of public life, for example, um, is now seen as a very progressive thing to say. And you say, but men too are like that. So we've actually yeah. just democratized what used to be a very degrading vision of human beings that was used in prejudice, that was very prejudicial. Um, and that was reserved for uh, ethnic minorities and, and, and women and, and as a justification for their low position in society. Now, right, what are the real kind of dangers of, of that then, you know, that democratization? Mm -hmm. what, what are the dangers? Yeah, what really worries you about, about that development? Because we need to have a strong sense of subjectivity if we're going to take over the world. No, if we're, if we're going to like overthrow and like, or if, if, if the future is going to be better, right? It requires us to fight for it, right? If we're in a passive position where everything just happens to us passively, then we're robbed of our agency, right? All that you can do is sort of like, like everybody, everybody becomes unsuitable for public life. We start to question democracy. Like that's become like a progressive thing that democracy that, oh, well, it should only be people who have degrees. They should be the ones to vote. Like that is so backward, um, but that is something that we say now, like as a, as a progressive kind of position, we, that we start to question the ability to, um, for people to hear arguments with which they disagree, right? Because that, that subject that is rational, capable of reflecting on one's feelings, that the white man used to be, right? Um, is now seen as a myth and not just a myth for some groups, for everybody. And so we, we then start to lose freedoms. And instead of the goal of our movements being freedom, right? Like how could you trust such a weak person to exercise freedom, to be like, to not have a state at all, 
right? Because that's that's Marxism, right? It's it's the end goal is a stateless society. Supposedly, the state withers away. That didn't happen, but supposedly, you're not supposed to have like this big brother kind of state. That was an aberration. Um, well, how can you trust human beings to live without a state, without some big brother telling them what to do, right? If human beings are just weak. Yeah. Uh, uh, to tie this back in into the conversation about happiness, I think it would be interesting to ask you about your stance on the mental health crisis and you saying that it's a myth. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I wonder if you could maybe elaborate a bit more on why, why it's such a myth. Again, when something creeps into the headlines, you assume that it's done so because things got so bad that people couldn't help to take, but take notice, which is what people thought about the happiness thing. Um, but if you look into it, you realize that actually that's not the case. There was a con conscious campaign to put this onto the political agenda. Um, uh, for a variety of reasons, you know, it fits with our depoliticized moment. It deflects attention from economic matters and, to, and naturalizes them. It, it gives lip service to it, but no one ever says like, oh, like, seriously, we're not going to have economic growth. It's like, no, we'll still have economic growth. We're just not going to talk about it, <laughs> which is like depoliticization of economics, um, which is what a long standing kind of neoliberal project is to get the working class's hands off the economy, right? Um, and so there's a lot of reasons why that became very powerful. Uh, and it's the same thing with mental health. So um, if you look into it, you know, what is this crisis? Well, it really depends. Um, one, you have to look at the fact that um, the categories of mental illness have expanded massively since the, for about the past half century. Um, so the, the expanse of what is considered abnormal is just enormous now. Um, and so there's that. Um, people are also more likely to, so there's this wonderful article by Ian Hacking called the, the Looping Effects of Human Kinds. And he says, you may have this idea of first there being the human kind and then the, the category that describes it. He says, that's not the case. The category and the kind grow together. So if you name a flower, it doesn't care what it's called. <laughs> um, but if you name, if you call a human being something, you put a human being into a category, it does have, it has a looping effect. You begin to understand, we understand who we are on the basis of the categories that our culture has available to us. Obviously there is a certain basic level of biology where there's what, you know, what previous uh, eras called madness that has always been around, but also the enormous amount of, um, the enormous range of just human emotion that's now considered aberrant and ill, and Ill health. Um, you know, that's also part of this, this humongous expansion that people are more likely to consider themselves um, to have poor mental health because any negative experience is now reconceptualized as a mental health problem or a mental health difficulty. Right. And that's actually become part of a conscious campaign. So if you look at the National Union of Students, they put out a survey and I think they probably put it out in 2012, but they began to publicize it in 2013, um, where they asked people, um, did you have any of these feelings in the last, you know, year, you know, stress, that kind of thing. Show me a student that isn't stressed. It's actually amazing. 20% of students said they didn't feel any stress. I didn't think that was possible. Anyway, so then they, so they said feelings, right? <laughs> no, no, for us. That's, that's not what we experienced. <laughs> and then when they publicize, when they write about it, they call the feelings symptoms. And it's very interesting, right? So any kind of negative feeling becomes a symptom. And then we can like conglomerate the symptoms into illnesses and it's a very uh -huh. common way of of expanding things they've done that in the 60s as well um so there's a very conscious campaign to set up mental health as a crisis um and if you look at the rates of diagnosis amazingly in spite of everything that i just said with the expansion of categories it's not actually ex uh, gone up that much you would i would have expected that there would be more people with diagnosable conditions. Um, and there's a lot going on there. It's very hard to get a diagnosis. It depends on what country you're in. And anyway, there's a whole bunch going on there. But it seems to be that there is an uptick in anxiety amongst young women. And that's about it. Um, and that's like really where the strongest evidence is. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's largely a, a social media problem, I think. I mean, I think a lot of that research is also, you know, for that result amongst young women, um, I don't know yeah, what age you'd say young women is, but at least middle school girls as well. I know that yeah, social media can have a big effect um, on, on these sorts of problems. It's hard to say though, because you want to have like a cause and effect kind of idea. A bad thing happens or you have this experience and then there's the reaction. 
but that's not how human beings work, right? We're not mice. It's not like stimulus response. We have to interpret our experience through a particular lens. Um, so like for instance, in um, the early 1990s, um, multiple personality disorder, which has since been renamed, went from like very few rare cases explain, uh, described at the, you know, at the turn of the, um, at the turn of the century to hundreds of thousands. And they were saying like every single um, major city in the United States was going to have a multiple personality disorder clinic, hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and then it disappeared. Mm. Um, and so this is the human psychology and human subjectivity is far more variable than we are led to believe. Um, and it, that is a very important thing to understand. However, I also think, and it's, there's like a, also like a very interesting sort of like cultural con, um, confluence of different sorts of emotions that become powerful in the culture and how they are manifested in the categories that people describe themselves um, with. This is not my research, but the very, some very interesting um, research that looks into that um, where um, there seems to be like, there's like an ebb and flow in terms of which diagnoses become very popular at particular times. And it's not just a stimulus response thing. Oh, this bad thing is more common and therefore people become sick in this way. That's not the case. Um, there's, a, there's a lot that goes on. Um, and I think in terms of anxiety, it's very interesting because risk awareness and a certain amount of anxiety about the world is absolutely encouraged by the culture and is seen as a very good thing. So if you like walk through a university hall you'll see all these posters along the wall like check your testicles check your breasts like environmental crisis world's gonna end tomorrow <laughs> not literally but there's all these things you're supposed to worry about there's a worry 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 you open the newspaper and and, and it's like the world you could be forgiven for thinking the world is going to hell in a handbasket because it's everything seems to go from bad to worse. And there's a reason for that, not because things are actually going from bad to worse, except right now, it seems that way. Um, but for the most part, that's not necessarily the case. But when people are, because we've seen this fragmentation of social movements into single issue movements, who are all competing with each other, the impetus is to big up your particular issue because you care about it, right? And you want attention. And so you try to create, do advocacy research and studies um, that will give you the most expansive possible um, net of people who may be affected by the issue. And that's why you see like one in eight people are, in, are uh, affected by mental health issues. One in four, one in two. How did it get so bad? Well, if you look at the, um, the surveys that they're using, each one asks a more expansive question. So they'll ask you, so the first NUS survey, for example, asked, did you have a diagnosed mental health condition? And the rate was, um, I'm sure for them, uh, disappointingly low. <laughs> it was about in line. Students had diagnosable mental health conditions and about this, at about the same rate as the general population. So the next survey, they smartened up. And they asked, did you feel that you had, whether or not it was diagnosed, did you feel that you had a mental health pro uh, uh, difficulties with your mental health in the past year? And then the number was huge. Because what, and then right after that, they asked about all these feelings. And so you are encouraged to believe that these feelings constitute mental health problems. So any, any kind of upset that you have is a mental health problem. But in terms of like anxiety, um, I think there's a very interesting like confluence there where you like health anxiety is absolutely encouraged like to be, or like as a parent, anxiety is like, as a good parent, you're supposed to be aware of like any and all risk. Like I am a basket case when it comes to my kids. Because, you know, people are like, it's my duty to let you know about all these different risks. And so I'm thinking about all these crazy things that could possibly happen. And I'm like, uh, you know, I'm very, very anxious because that in my culture has encouraged me that, that that is a good way to be. And then I go, oh, why are you so anxious? <laughs> don't, don't you think it's also a good thing that sometimes things get named as uh, a mental illness? For example, coming back to women being mm. named hysterical for actual depressive uh, feelings. You could say that like the, the transformation from being an emotion of hysteria or just being on your period to women can get depressed. That's, for me, mm. it seems like a positive uh, change. Yeah, absolutely. And there are some, there are absolutely some good things about it or people would not be so open to labeling themselves in these ways. Um, it, it certainly, it removes blame. Um, it, you know, it's, it gives a, a sense of why 
right? Like this meaning, we don't have like this meaning in life. And like, I grew up in therapy culture myself, right? Like the reason why I'm so critical of it is because I grew up in this world and I thought that was just the way things are. It's just scientists have discovered this is the way human beings are. And when I learned that these things have a history and um, the way that they're part of these campaigns and so on, I was really angry. I was like, you told me that that's how I was supposed to be. I was supposed to be constantly obsessing about my emotions and my feelings and so on. But I also recall that, you know, I didn't have like a, like a map for my life. I felt this normlessness, right? Like, who am I supposed to be? What am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to act? Just tell me how I'm supposed to act. And my dad would say like, you be who you want to be. You become whatever you want. And I'm like, no, you just tell me. <laughs> like, I want a rule book. And there was no rule book, right? All of those rules that tradition and so on used to provide are dissipated. They're gone. And where do we find it now? Well, where I found it in like these self-help books, right? Like I would put like things on my wall, like don't save up your happiness for the future. Be happy now. And that mm. made me a basket case because I was like, why can't I be happy all the time? <laughs> You know, and that I realized you don't have to think about your feelings so much. It will actually make things worse if that's if you're always thinking about yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah so I'm, I'm I really, thinking about a project beyond myself. As well. Yeah. Like I really noticed. I really noticed this. Um, but you know, if I talk to my mom or something, like the the generational difference between you know our like generation and you know people five ten years older than us. Um, you know, twenty year olds. You know, there's this big emphasis on you know how you feel the whole time, and you know, there's just a lot more attention uh, to inwardly, I think, than perhaps you know at least you know, my mom gives me the impression was was like in her time. Uh, it's nothing. There's no meaning beyond the self. It's everything is self-contained, and like that can be a good thing because I remember coming across these categories and then feeling this sense of relief, right? Like, oh, it's not my fault, you know. But at the same time, it can also be a way, just in the same way as hysteria was, it can become a way of, of not listening to people. So postnatal depression, for example, if you read some of the stories that people, like they, they'll make claims like 80% of women have been affected by postnatal depression. Like if it's that much, you know, you need to start asking yourself, what are we really talking about here? I remember reading this article once where this man was, it was like, not just women can have postnatal depression, men too, right? That's very progressive. But again, that's the democratization of what used to be something very belittling. Um, so it's like, we're all sick. You know? <laughs> um, but the, the guy was talking like, his life was horrible. Like the, he was like up all night and then he's working full time and he's like, hasn't slept in like four months. And, and he's like, oh, I realized that I had um, postnatal depression. And like, no, you didn't. You needed like time off work, you know, and it becomes this way of individualizing what ought to be. If we realize we all have this kind of problem, we can push and they, like, people did for a little bit of paternity leave. Um, but it becomes this way of like belittling things and not talking about the enormous, for example, pressure on women now to be intensive workers, right? You, you know, you're letting feminism down. If you're not on the C, if you're not on the board of directors, if you're not a CEO, why aren't there so many CEOs? But at the same time, you have to be an intensive mother. And if you let up the slack, you are to blame for all social problems. Oh, it's the parents, the lazy parents. Oh my God. Parents spend way more time with their children statistically than they did 35 years ago. People find that surprising because it's just so much parent bashing. So you don't want to be complicit for social problems. So you become an intensive mother. I got to be doing, you know, am I saying enough words for her? Am I putting the right creams? Am I feeding her the right foods? God forbid you take them to McDonald's to make things a little easier for yourself. Uh, no, no, no. Now you're making them fat. You know, of course, that, that is horrible. It's very difficult. And to medicalize that means that we don't have a conversation about those conflicting um, pressures that we're putting on women, just to give you one example. So it these, this individualization and this medicalization can be a way of deflecting attention from uh, a cultural conversation that we're not having or an economic conversation that we're not having and individualize that this is your problem, you deal with it, you're sick. Mm. Um, um, you're, you talk a lot about individualization of these societal problems, but I'm wondering, uh, how does this translate to cultures where there's a more communal structure? So, sorry, medicalization of social problems? No, the, the individual, individualization, individualization of like societal um, problems. I'm not totally sure. It's not something that I have, I've studied a great deal. There is a very good um, area of research that looks at the globalization of these trends. Um, so I would, if anybody's interested in that, I would, you know, there's um, 
um, Daniel Kerrigan, um, China Mills, Daniel Naring, uh, Vanessa Popovac. So there are lots of people who, who look at that global aspect of things. Um, so I do, like, I, I can't give you examples from my own research, but for example, there's um, very good research on PTSD and the way that um, that assumption, that cause and effect kind of relationship, bad things happens, you become damaged, you become traumatized. Um, when that is exported abroad, it actually undermines people's existing coping mechanisms and their existing relationships. It, it divides them and individualizes them. There are some really awful cases too where people have been offered mental health support that they don't care about, need or want, or is not part of their culture or understanding of things before they get food, <laughs> um, before they get help locating loved ones after a natural disaster. So there's awful cases like that. Um, but there's, I remember somebody sent me a, um, I can't remember what it was. If it was an excerpt from a paper, I wish I could remember because it was a very good quote. But it was um, where this person was saying like after, after a disaster, all these like psychologists came and they took them one by one into this tent and made them talk about their feelings and how they felt about things. And they just thought it was so alien. And they were like, this is so, what a weird experience it was. And they were like, where, where's the sunshine? Where are the drum beats? Where's the dancing? That is how we would come together and reconnect as a society and affirm our foundational ideals of community and so on. Um, that's their way of overcoming something. But you have this Western idea that's very individual. It says bad thing happens, you'll be traumatized. And it's not necessarily helpful. And it may be, oh, there's a very good paper, sorry. There's a very good paper by Derek Summerfield um, called uh, My Whole Body is Sick. I love this paper. It's very, very good. Highly recommend it. Um, where it's about this woman from Rwanda who's lived the most horrible life anyone could possibly think, like, horrible. And she is expressing this, her discontent in all these different ways. And the people that she sees all try to fit her discontent into these Western boxes. And he says, there's no doubt I, you know, that she'll get a diagnosis of PTSD. And does that actually help her or does it help us? Um, it helps us to understand it and it's gonna, and it will help her because you need that diagnosis in order to get access to certain funds in our society. But does it actually fit what she's going through? Not at all. This is, but this is, this sounds like it's a kind of a, you know, very much related to traditional psychology's conception of the human, this kind of deficit model, this pathology based model. And, you know, arguably positive psychology is trying to move away from that. You know? <laughs> They're not. Uh, they claim that, right? If you were really trying to move away from that, um, then why do you need to promote happiness? Right? Why is like I saw like sociologists try to jump on this bandwagon too. Like, oh, sociologists, we're always talking about problems. Why don't we talk about how we can facilitate flourishing? Well, why do you think it needs to be facilitated? The mm -hmm. old idea was once you dealt with problems, people would be free to do whatever they want. Now we have to help them even to do that, even just to live, even just everyday life. There's no part of everyday life that hasn't been colonized by an expert. There's nothing that is too mundane for expertise. And that is a, that is a degradation. That is a full, that is the um, expansion of that deficit model, even to making things go well. Yeah, that is, yeah. I, I think it's a deepening of it. But, it, it, uh, but it, it, uh, it's tricky, like in my mind at least, because you know, t how can you separate you know, this kind of construction of a, a vulnerable subject with you know, the, the negative consequences of that, that we've, we've talked about with something like, you know, going back to like social media or mobile phones, you know, that is like a real change in our environment, which mm -hmm. can have very real effects. And, you know, a lot of the research, especially in America on kind of anxiety or depression or stress levels have been have been linked to that. And so how do we know, how do you really get to the core of, of what the problem is it about is about? Is it about us and how we're viewing, you know, people and this kind of individualization and medicalization? Or is it actually very real psychological Kind of inputs like constantly having a, a mobile phone and that hit of dopamine when someone likes your instagram photo like how do you mm -hmm. kind of separate and try and get to what you know be able to say with any definity what the problem is i mean it really depends on i mean how you kind of frame the problem and what the solution is like there, i think a lot of the language of addiction and so on like mobile phone addiction kind of constructs people as really really passive but also we have kind of conflicting ideas in the culture right so you know six months ago it was like oh mo mobile phones and too much time on the internet this is really really bad and it's causing a generation of, of mental uh people with mental ill health um and now we're all locked in our houses and it's not a problem anymore 
And it's this wonderful thing and that, and you know, we can have a whole year of university classes, they're saying, um, totally virtually, and that's fine, right? Or like, you know, internet porn is another one, right? So there's this conflicting kind of idea in society that porn is this wonderful thing and this is part of like adult relationships and it can be real fun. Huh? Um, but at the same time, it's so bad for you, stop, <laughs> right? And so you're kind of disempowered from like, oh, well, I'm a progressive type, I accept porn, and yet I see, actually, you know, it's screwing up my relationship. Um, and then it's like, oh, porn addiction. It's like, actually, you have the power to just stop watching it. Just don't look at it if it's causing you problems, right? Or, you know, we're kind of disempowered from doing that. Um, and it's and then you bring in all of this, like, brain science and so on, which is of questionable quality, um, to say that these things are, 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 you know, truly, truly impossible to overcome, and yet people do. Um, and also, like, with stress and so on, I find it very difficult. Like, this, the thing is that I don't think people are lying or making it up, that people are very, very stressed out and very anxious. Um, I just think that it's not a necessary relationship between what happens to you in life and your out and, and, and how you will feel about it. Because if you look through human history, like, or even just recent history, in the 1960s, for example, the word stress wasn't really, or sorry, before the 1960s, the word stress wasn't even really in our lexicon. Um, and then it suddenly burst onto the scene in the 60s. Well, why? And then it took off in the 80s as well. Well, why? Because the world got so much more stressful. I find that hard to believe if you think about what it was like during the Industrial Revolution when you had like children falling into machines, like your limb getting ripped off, working 18 hour days and dropping dead. Like, <laughs> like that was what life was like. And yet they didn't use the word stress um, because there was some kind of outward expression um, of this discontent. There was a, a workers' movement um, that was gaining power. Um, and when that all died, the language of stress became very powerful. So you can actually see this. This is uh, Wainwright and Cal Calnan's book, um, The Rise of the Work Stress Epidemic. I can't remember exactly what the title is, but this is what they describe basically, that as all these different avenues for um, expressing your discontent were closed down, the individualized language of stress became a very powerful way of expressing discontent. Um, and so it's this like, it's just me and myself, my own relationship with my work instead of something that I share with other people and that I can then gather and fight against, right? Because if I, if I say, if I stop calling it stress, the individual thing, and I say overwork, that is something that the capitalist has to do something about and that other people are experiencing the same way. But if I talk about stress, well, we'll have well-being Wednesdays. Everybody, our well-being is so important. Let's all have mindfulness. So we, the response is individual. It very it matters a lot how you express a problem. Do you express it through the individualized idiom that we're more or less given in the culture? That's very like very passive, you know, very um, very individual, very medical. Or do you express it in a social way and and something that connects with other people and therefore. Um, through which we can find a more a, a social solution, an economic solution. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's the difference. So, like a general criticism on sociology and, and anthropology, for example, is that they're very good at finding problems, but very bad at finding solutions. Mm -hmm. Talks a lot about these problems within the narrative, and just like you, you said it yourself, like how do we look at these problems? Do you have any clue for a solution? Yeah, um, so when I criticize, so I criticize the whole happiness thing and I say it's deflecting attention from these areas that I think are important and that is the economy basically, is that we need to repoliticize economics. Um, and I'm, that's like my life as well. I'm trying to learn about, you know, I'm trying to understand the economic base um, along with like seven other people. Um, but like, that's what I, I wish we were, we were talking about. Um, so, but when I was like sort of criticizing these things, I was trying to understand like lots of people criticize these things. Um, and yet criticism has no impact because it's not organized. You don't, you have to organize to make something an issue in the same way that you have to organize to, to push back. And there's no incentive to organize against something like this, right? Um, you're not gonna make any money. <laughs> um, you're gonna look bad because you're, you're organizing it something that sounds very good. Um, but also, Every time one of these fads disappears, another one comes up that says very similar things that expands, expands the problem of, hum, of, of human subjectivity to, to just deeper and deeper. Like we all become 
unable to control anything in our lives. Um, and it, that it, each time it just, it keeps coming back. So that means that when we're criticizing it, we're not reaching what's really going on because the underlying trends, the underlying phenomena that feed into these cultural expressions are still there. And so we need to understand what are, what is that deeper expression? What is that deeper base um, uh, that is leading to the subject to become so degraded, um, mm. that is leading us to be so dehumanized. Um, and I think, and this is my new, like, I had an epiphany the other day. I don't know. I, I'm starting to think that the economic base is also changing. And it's changing in ways that are not progressive, obviously. I mean, but like I could champion the productivity of capitalism because I can see that that there's a germ there that if human beings could take hold of that, we will be able to produce a basis of comfort um, that will require very, very little human labor. We won't have to reproduce our existence through so much work and we won't have to work so much for somebody else. Um, that we could then be free in the sense of like truly free to, you know, you could be you know, the famous line in the German ideology to be like a fisherman or a philosopher in the evening, blah, 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 rather than having to be just one of those things, right? You can be whatever you want, right? There's that basis of freedom. But at the same time, capitalism also seems to be changing in a way that is cutting off that basis. Um, there seems to be this attempt to, um, to hold back even that productiveness. Um, and that's what I think is. In what really sense? You mean like, uh, could you give like a, you know, like. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I'm like, I shouldn't say this because I'm, I'm so, it's just the germ. Right. It's just the germ of a thought um, that I think that this kind of like, I don't know, the ruling class is like shoring up what it's got. Um, and it's saying in, through progressive language, you know, you people, you shouldn't be able to fly anymore. You people, you shouldn't be able to have these things anymore. Um, and why is that happening? It's so contradictory. Um, and so I'm just trying to figure out what's going on there. But I was thinking, like, why is the subject degrading? Well, why did the subject emerge? You know, why did this idea of the free willing rational subject even emerge? Because the possibility of its expression emerged. With capitalism, we could see it, it could never come to fruition within capitalism, but we could see just a tiny little bit of freedom that wasn't available to human beings in the past. When you were born a peasant, you died a peasant, you were tied to the land. Now capitalism freed you to sell your labor to any capitalist that would have you, right? So you're free to becoming a musician if someone will pay you to be a musician, but you're not if you can't. So there's, but there's a tiny little bit more freedom there. And we can imagine that we can go a little bit further, right? That we could be freed even from having to sell our labor to a capitalist. And then if you want to be a musician, you damn well be a musician because <laughs> you want to. And you, that because your food, you know, comrade Alexa <laughs> uh, appears with your food order at your door mm. and you can be a musician, right? Yeah. But um, so that possibility of that subjectivity emerged, but now it is rescinding. Now we have a very degraded understanding of the human subject. Why? I think because the economic base is changing and the possibility of our freedom is rescinding. That's what I'm worried about. And I don't know the, what that means. Kind of, yeah, like the, the takeaway message, I guess, and the, you know, when we talk about kind of happiness or, or positive psychology in these developments, it's, you're not saying, you know, don't meditate or, you know, whatever, like, that's, that's not the point. The point is actually viewing it within a broader system and the kind of, yeah, the subjectivity that we, how we kind of view ourselves and what that really potentially means in terms of, possible kind of horizons for for society not just ourselves but humanity in general um is what i don't like is having this um very determined idea of what it means to be human mm. uh, because that closes off everything there's just no point in in trying if human beings are determined if we have no control if it if it's just an expression of our genes you know then it'll just always be this way mm. Mm. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for. Um, <laughs> but thank you very much. It's been it's been fascinating, really. Like, uh, yeah, I think we've gone down quite a few different paths, but hopefully, uh, people will be able to to take something from it. Kind of positive psychology and happiness from a, a Marxist perspective, maybe, um, <laughs> is the the general message. So yeah, thank, thank you very you. much for uh, thank for, you yeah, so much for on. having me. Thank yeah. you.